jeepers! You're listening to Smash or Pass. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another interview on the JB and Millie channel. I am JB, and of course, with me is Millie. Hi. And the special guest who'll be interviewing today is Rachel Kimsey. Thank you so much for joining. Hi. I'm so happy to be here. It is an absolute honor to have you here. People watching this will recognize you as the voice of Wonder Woman, along with a lot of other iconic characters throughout the years. And going through those years, according to IMDb, at least your career began in 1999. But before that point, what made you want to go down the path of actor? You know, I'm that kid that I stumbled across it as a child and it never left the back of my mind as the thing I wanted to do. Um, <clears throat> and so I started, you know, doing plays in school and, and, uh, trying to find places to, to do them in my community. And when it came time from college, my parents were very encouraging of getting a degree in something useful. And I said, I mean, acting, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> and so I never pursued doing a useful job. I've, this has been my only goal, my only plan, um, from the time that I was pre-teenager. Uh, and I don't necessarily recommend not building a marketable skill on the side, but it worked out for me because there was never really a fallback plan. <laughs> no, I mean, it certainly worked perfectly. And I mean, can I ask, is there, I know you said, you know, you discovered it early and just knew that it was what you wanted to do. Was there ever any actors or projects that you came across and that kind of inspired you in a way? I mean, this is going to sound like a plant, but the truth is like one of the first things that I remember having a massive impact on me as a kid was watching Linda Carter's Wonder Woman. Like I remember putting on my Wonder Woman underoos and like running around the backyard and like imagining Wonder Woman playing Wonder Woman and my mother being like, that's underwear, get in the house. Um, you know, I grew up on the magic of sesame street and uh and i, I was a, a real bookworm right from the beginning um and so things like reading rainbow where i got to see kids read books and talk about the books that they love and the characters they love i was like wait i could i could not only enjoy this but that i could share it with other people and so it was this kind of like slow building idea to grow but I mean, Wonder Woman was one of my first truly iconic characters that landed somewhere deep inside my soul as somebody that was important to me and it never went away. And, you know, on top of that, all, all kinds of other things came and grew. Um, my parents limited our, our television and our movie viewing a lot. And so the things that we were allowed to have, like, locked in there like we we did looney tunes and we did scooby-doo and we did um a certain amount of like hanna barbera and um i hear other people talk about watching saturday morning cartoons and i'm like that sounds nice we didn't get to watch saturday morning cartoons <laughs> um but those things that were a part of my um childhood and development like they never left and so the way that they continue to come back has continued to be meaningful. And then it also means that I've gotten to go back and discover other things over time. The, the big gift of doing um, piano lessons when I was a kid, I have a brother just two years older and two years younger than me. We all did piano lessons together and it was very exciting because we'd all go to the piano teacher's house together and one of us would have a lesson and the other two got to watch cartoons. <laughs> And so it would be this fight, like, who gets to watch Robotech? Who gets to watch Thundercats? Who gets to watch G.I. Joe? And we would we would swap who would watch, which who watched Voltron? <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I think even JB would have agreed to piano lessons just to sit and watch cartoons, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, it, was it was the best. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly sounds it. And, um... So I guess kind of as well, I would like to ask a lot of people that, you know, watch these interviews certainly have aspirations of, you know, going into the industry and that kind of thing. Would you have any advice for people that are looking to, you know, get into the industry? I think the biggest thing is go in with your heart and your mind open. You don't know what you have to offer until you begin putting it out there, you know? Everybody has a superpower, but even you don't know what it is. 
you'll only start to know what it is when you begin to put yourself out there, when you begin to, to get go out and try. And the thing that's really hard to wrap your head around in the beginning is you will be rejected more than you are accepted for a long time. I mean, kind of forever. Like there's always gonna be more projects you don't get than projects that you do. Um, and that's okay. That's part of the process. And it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. And it doesn't mean you're not wonderful. It means that that wasn't your project today. And there's a time and a place for you. And the number of times that I've been on something where the reason they loved me was because of something something else didn't want me for, you know? or things that I've been rejected for that then came back and became something that was desirable. Like, don't change yourself to be what you think they want. Fill yourself up with who you are and what matters to you and find the places that need that because there is somebody who needs you. There is a project that needs you. There is a team that needs you. There is an art that needs you and you won't know where it is until you live fully into yourself and go put it out there. And all that sounds kind of like woo woo, but what it looks like is audition for everything, read for everything, work on your friends' student films and projects, go do plays for free, go do dubs, you know, of animes online, like put, put it out there, give it a go, you never know, and follow the yeses. I, I really like that. No, that's incredible. A nice message there of of the endurance as well. And, and that's so applicable to a lot of things as well. And I think it's a testament in terms of what you said about not changing yourself or your style, because the style that you have can be used to, you know, go into so many different mediums. So of course, you've done the live action work and the voiceover work for shows and movies, but also games as well, which I think is really interesting. Like, of course, there was Betty Brandt in the Spider-Man game and a lot of the other Call of Duty games as well. So did your methodology change at all when going into, say, a video game versus an episode of TV or a movie? So here's the thing that's funny, and this is what I mean about live into yourself, right? Betty Brandt was such a gift to me because I had just been in a really bad motorcycle accident and broke my leg and I couldn't stand and I couldn't go work on camera and I couldn't do TV shows. And somebody said, can you do this voice? And I was like, yes. And I did that job sitting in a chair with my cast propped up on a stool and a microphone in my face. And I went, maybe I should keep working on this skill. Maybe this is something that will continue to come in handy for me. The thing that's funny about games is I didn't really know much about the landscape of how games worked, but there was a casting director that I had auditioned for, for television, for films, and for other voiceovers for years. Her name is Ivy Eisenberg. I'm going to give her credit because she changed my life and my career forever. I auditioned for her for 10 years and did not get a single job. But she kept seeing me. She kept calling me. She kept asking me to come back. And there wasn't anything wrong with what I was doing. Those weren't my jobs. Mm -hmm. And one day she said, I have something for you. And I got my very first job in a very small soldier role on uh call of duty ghosts she's like i think you've got this and she gave me a shot and i learned so much doing that job i learned on the job i'm so grateful for the people who trusted me and then taught me while i was there how to protect my voice what it sounded like who weren't afraid to give me direction because i wasn't afraid to take it right you can't let it hurt your feelings when people give you direction that's their job so your job is to take it and roll with it, right? And when the next opportunity came along, I knew what I was capable of. And all this stuff that had nothing to do with acting is what helped me get the job. I, my family, I have a, my, I come from a family with a lot of military connections. So it's language that isn't unfamiliar to me. I have used a lot of um, tools and weapons growing up in different ways for mostly for fun. 
Um, but because of some of that family stuff and because I, my dad and all my brothers were Boy Scouts and brothers in the military and things. So those things were not unfamiliar to me. I was a CrossFit coach mm -hmm. as a day job. So that meant that I yelled all day long because by the way, even when you're working a lot as an actor, it is not uncommon to have one or two or three day jobs to keep things going. That doesn't mean you're failing. That means you're feeding yourself, right? And my voice was physically so strong from yelling all day over the top of weights and barbells and music that when it came time to step into the role of a soldier that calls out over a battlefield, I was like, yeah, I'm ready. I got it. I'm prepared for that, right? So it's, the, it's not just the things that you do that's like, ooh, I gotta craft my art. It's the stuff that you do in your life. It's the stuff that is who you already are that shows up and suddenly makes you go, this is the right one for you. And because Ivy gave me that first shot on Ghosts and then gave me the shot on uh, Black Ops 3, an entire world of games opened up to me because now I get it. Now I, now I understand it. Now I can come in and do in two takes what might have taken me a few years ago, four or five or seven takes. So people want to call me because I can come in and do that job quickly and efficiently, and I know how to be healthy. But it's that process, right? And so the difference between that and say doing a soap opera, which I was specifically forbidden from watching growing up, was I came in and I was like, it kind of looks like a play, like it sort of looks like a theater set. So I'm just gonna treat it like that, I guess. And I got to do that. And Speaking of plays, I don't know. Do you guys know this? Do you guys know I, I've done exactly one Broadway level play in my life? Oh, no, I don't think I, I came up. Scooby Doo. Oh, oh that's incredible. Oh, wow. That's one where I was like, wait, they're doing Scooby Doo as like a giant Broadway style play? I'll go audition for that. And I, I went into my, I was, you guys, I was so poor. I went to the gym bathroom at the gym where I worked, not the gym where I paid for a membership because I was too poor to pay for a gym membership. I worked at a gym. <laughs> I bought temporary red hair dye and I dyed my hair in the sink at the gym before I went to the audition because I was like, I'm going to Daphne, I'm going to do it. And I showed up in a purple dress with red hair and I cocked my hip and I got to do Daphne that was amazing. <laughs> for like six months and it was amazing and it was life-changing because I just said well I watched like four cartoons growing up and this was one of them so what if they say yes to me what if I what if I show up See, that is incredible. Do you, do you remember what that production was called? Because I know that there's been a few around and about, but like, do you remember like what year that was? Like when they were, like ran, what it was called? Gosh, don't ask me what year it was. I don't. <laughs> I have no sense of time anymore. Um, but it was uh. Now you just asked me. It was Scooby Doo. Because now all I can think of is Guess Who. It was. Come back to me. Oh my gosh! I have the poster someplace. Oh my gosh! Wow, really? That was amazing. I will find it. I'll find it. Um, but it was it was uh, what? you guys. We traveled with the mystery machine. It was so much fun. I've got oh. pictures of of me and Velma like at the mystery machine, like bopping around. It's great. Super fun. Well, that is absolutely incredible. Or well, I guess in terms of like maybe not exactly dating it, I mean, do you recall if at that point you had any references? Like, do you know if the Sarah Michelle Gellar live action version that happened at that point to be able to play off of, or was it very much its own kind of unique thing? I feel like that feature had come out just a few years before, just like I I think it would have been um would have been around the two thousand ish. No, no, no. It would have been more like 2002 or three, somewhere in there. Because um, I'm like, wait, when did I live in New York? And when was I at the, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was just, it was, it was the coolest experience. And all of that is to say, like, you never know what about your real life is going to come into play and what things you're going to fall in love with. And the result of that, right, 
because I loved that and because I'm still in touch with a, a lot of the, the cast members that we worked on that with and, and the director as well. Um, because of that, when I got to do Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, and they called me in for Wonder Woman, I was like, this is amazing. It's like two of my favorite things together. And I couldn't stop myself in the session talking about like the fantasy of getting to say the line. Mm. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, there's always that that meddling kids line as well that people like it always looked as the always it's all I wanted in the whole and they were they were like, Oh, you really mean it, don't you? I was like, Yes. <laughs> so they brought me back and I got to do another episode where I got to play the bad and I got to say the line and I got to do that. It was like, What? This happened? And none of it is like sitting in your room going, God, I really hope I get to do Scooby-Doo someday. It's just living your life and showing up with your passions and showing up with your joy and being very lucky. So lucky. But like, I cared about it in a special way because I had done the other show and then they brought me in to do Wonder Woman, which was two things I love. And then I told them about my passion about it and they were excited about that too. And so we all got to come into, you know, it's, the, these things build and they grow and they feed each other and there's a lot of luck and a lot of endurance that's a part of it but love the things you love don't be afraid to love the things you love because that is what's going to pay off in the end mm -hmm. i can't pretend to love stuff i don't know about i can't pretend to love stuff that, that isn't meaningful to me but also I had never watched a single minute of a soap opera until I was on one and I fell in love with the people I worked with. So I cared about that world because the people I worked with were the were amazing. It was never my dream to do a soap opera, but I'll tell you what, I'd go do that job again like that. Anybody want to take me back? I'll take it. It's a great job full of wonderful people having a great time. Mm, I think it is great that you speak about, you know, going into something that you're passionate about. And it's just amazing to hear that from watching the Linda Carter woman, um, Wonder Woman, you know, as a child and then getting to play Wonder Woman. And so you were quite familiar with the Wonder Woman character, the franchise as a whole. But was there any part of Linda Carter's Wonder Woman that you wanted to really bring to your iteration when the time came? Or did you want it to be very much your own spin on it? So here's the thing about me and Wonder Woman. I feel like some of those characters have like a sound and a tone and a thing, right? And with Wonder Woman, I think part of it is because I was so young that it left me with a feeling more than a fact. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't gonna be able to sit there and list all the different things about Wonder Woman, but I knew what she meant to me. I knew how it made me feel, right? And over the course of years, I, you know, I'd, I'd read Wonder Woman comics and, and other comics. Um, and I knew what it felt like to, to have something that was that meaningful. When the audition came in for the show, I, they actually sent me three roles on the same day. And I was so paralyzed by the idea of reading for my hero that I read the other two first. <laughs> I was like, well, I mean, I have great ideas for these characters. And I would like to say I did a great job. <laughs> but I was so nervous about Wonder Woman that I had to I had to make it wait. And I sat there and I was like, what does Wonder Woman sound like? What is what does she sound like? I I know what Batman sounds like, I know what Superman sounds like. Like if, if there's a sound, right? I know what I know what a witch sounds like. There's a and I had a moment, and I know I've said this in interviews before, but it was a really profound experience for me and I will live off of it for the rest of my career. I had a moment where I sat there and it still moves me to think of it every time I sat there and I said, you know, what does she sound like? I don't know, but I know how she makes me feel. So what she's going to sound like is what I sound like when I feel like Wonder Woman. And that's what I did because I didn't know what else to do. And that day, the people making that show wanted that version. And I am so gifted that they chose me that that day, that thing was what worked for all of us together. Cause there are some extraordinary women who are doing it right now and who've done it before me and will do it again. And, and everybody brings their own thing. 
And the thing that was so funny, you guys, is the number of times on the show that they'd be like, well, we, we love your thing, so bring your thing. And I was like, what's my thing? Because I didn't know what it was. I just did what made sense to me. I wasn't making like some conscious choice to do it a certain way that was different from anybody else or the same as something. I just did what made sense to me. And that's what worked for this particular group and this particular show. I think part of it for that show was, and I got some grief for this. Um, I was always, I loved Wonder Woman's strength and power. I loved that when I was a kid, there weren't other female superheroes. There weren't. So I loved that she was strong. And as an adult, I can look back and I can see the peace and the patience and the love that came with that strength. But as a kid, what animated me was she is strong. She is powerful and she's not afraid to be powerful because she owns her strength. And so I think that's part of what I brought to it. Um, and there were some people who were like, yes, but she's always fill in the blank, whatever you feel about her, which is totally legitimate. And I was like, yeah, but I like her strength. <laughs> I like, I like her power. I like, and we had a great time on Justice League Action because we were allowed to have a sense of humor. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that, that we didn't have to play it super straight and tight, that we got to really have a good time together. Um, there were some characters that we got to have, like uh, Wonder Woman and Green Lantern got to have like a great sort of bantery relationship and um, Wonder Woman and Plastic Man and Wonder Woman and Booster Gold, like this this kind of um, secondary relationship that I certainly didn't know existed in anything else, but we wrote it, We I had nothing to do with the writing. They wrote these beautiful relationships and I got to have this incredibly fun time with with Chris and Dana and Diedrich and have these great joyful relationships that then translate to a really fun show. And I guess that's different than some other people, but it was just doing what made sense at the time, which if I had one piece of advice for any artist is do that. You can't be truly great if you're trying to do what someone else did. You'll only be able to be truly great if you're doing the thing that makes sense to you. So live it. And it won't always be the right thing for the right group. And that's okay. Because when it is right, you'll find your place. And I think what you're saying there relates back really well to like you're saying where the voice from Wonder Woman came from. Just knowing you, knowing your backstory, knowing kind of what's important to you, what your experience has been. Because that voice came from a feeling as opposed to reading a script or trying to work out what that character's personality traits was or perhaps what kind of physical traits they have and trying to put on a performance. You know what I mean? It wasn't about underlying features. It was this is the feeling and just channeling that through the experiences that you've had. So I think, like you say, it's very much kind of a strong thing to bear in mind is just drawing upon yourself and who you are and can I ask in terms of I know you're saying about reading for the you know reading for the three characters and the three parts that you had but do you know kind of do you remember how you became involved with Justice League Action was it kind of do you know how you got up to the interview process and everything the audition process um so I I was really lucky the audition just came straight through uh, my agent um I'd been working in voiceover for a long time by then um, and, and this is the other thing, you guys, the first cartoon I ever booked ever was Wonder Woman. That's not how that usually works. Like usually like you get to practice doing other things and there's small roles and, and, the, and I'd been working a long time in a lot of, I'd done a ton of commercials. I'd done games at that point. I'd done TV, I'd done film, I'd done theater. It's not like acting was new, but uh, the first cartoon I ever booked was Wonder Woman in the Justice League. You know, sometimes it's, sometimes there's like a scaling up process and sometimes it's being the right person in the right place at the right time with the right mix. And um, I got really lucky. The audition came through my agents um, and 
there were other there were other shows that I I'd done auditions and done callbacks for and taken you know gone further down the process and it didn't go my way and that was fine but this one I literally I I sent the audition and then I got the job there wasn't an in between um and but but um when we got called in to do the pilot I knew perfectly well from years of in the entertainment industry that a pilot is just a pilot. It doesn't mean the show's getting bought. It doesn't mean that the cast is going to remain the same. It doesn't mean that things aren't going to change. And so I remember really consciously going in on the day of the pilot and going, the worst case scenario is that they fire me after this and they hire someone else to do the show. And even if that happens today, I am Wonder Woman. So today I get to be Wonder Woman and that's what I get to do. And the truth is there were, um, there were some shakeups between the pilot and the show while they were still kind of figuring out what was going to be what and how it was going to work. And the episode that we shot as the pilot ended up like featuring way later in the season and they rewrote a whole new start for it because that's just how things go. And I was so fortunate to be able to stay on that they did keep me. And every single day I was like, if they fire me after today, today, I still got to be Wonder Woman. <laughs> and every day they didn't fire me and I got to stay Wonder Woman for the, for the duration of the show. And it was, and it was amazing. And, um, and I've gotten to do further projects with Warner Brothers and with DC and, and, some of them on so this this new movie that that we have coming out um uh i am wonder woman is in it and it's not me it's donna katrick and she's amazing i think i pronounced her name right she's amazing in it and i got to play somebody else and it was awesome and i'm not mad about it because i got to have this amazing time playing a different character who is awesome um and it, it's funny sometimes people they're like well how do you feel about that i'm like lucky to be on the list look at the people who got to play wonder woman i'm on that list are you kidding me that's that's the gift if i ever get to do it again amazing if i never get to do it again look at the company i'm keeping not to mention what it means to me personally yes so. it is absolutely amazing and just so impressive to hear that it was the first animation that you booked and i guess even more impressive as well considering that you're going into that show with a lot of you know decade career-wise old legends such as you know of course now the late but a legendary kevin conroy you've got mark hamill like was it one of the shows where you got to go in and you worked with them in person or was it remote like how was it like to know at least that you were around such a star-studded cast we were so incredibly lucky that we got to record as a group it's the only show i've ever gotten to do that on um, my husband also works as a voice actor and he's worked on several shows and he's never got, he, uh, this, this poster is for a, a show called Cruise Family Tree that he was on. He was so excited. He's like, I finally get to do a group record show. And then the pandemic happened and they, they oh, to record no. really. um, so I am absurdly lucky that the one show I've ever gotten to do group records on was this one because it was just hero after icon, after dear friend, after person you know genius that i got to work with like <laughs> the day that kevin conroy and mark hamill walked into the studio together and then like giggled because they saw each other and like grabbed each other in a huge hug because they cared about each other so much like i was like being in the room with either of them would have been a gift but seeing them together I was like this is life-changing right like i got to i get to work with tara strong i, I got to work with uh natasha leggero i i got to work with crispin freeman and diedrich bader and data snyder and like I just i won't even be able to come up with all the names just so many people and it was such a learning experience oh my gosh you guys doing a single episode with john dimaggio i walked out and i was like i've had an entire animation class like it was, I learned so much just by being in the same room with these people. Like I made a point of being prepared and doing my best and showing up as fully present as possible. And then also like 
watch and listen and learn. And so much of it is just enjoying being together that that alone taught me a ton, taught me a ton. And, and seeing people like, like Kevin is so interesting, right? Um, and so dearly missed partly because of his extraordinary talents, of course, but also partly because he would show up and he would just, he was just a joy and a light in every room he was in. He was so, I certainly didn't know him as well as so many people, but every minute that we were together was the best minute of that day, you know? Um, and then you'd call action and it would start and he was 100% focused. He was 100% Batman and Bruce Wayne. He was absolutely professional down to the finest detail. And then you call cut and it's joy. And that is also a gift to learn. Like if you do the work, you can be fully present in the work and then you can be fully present with people and it doesn't have to bleed over. You can, you can find that, that dial that says, now I'm here with you and now I'm here in the work. And, uh, and it, it's just, it was, it was so lucky. It was so, Jessica Walters played my mom, you guys. What? <laughs> Like what? I got to go into a room with Cloris Leachman, who totally made fun of me for telling her how grateful I was that she existed in the world and changed women and women's roles in entertainment and comedy. She was like, she was like listening to me patiently as I'm like trying to not get weepy with my like, you're so cool and so grateful. And she was just like, come on, kid, let's go to work. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> See, yeah. this next question might be quite close to impossible to answer because I'm guessing there's a lot. We've heard there's a lot. But do you have a favorite memory from working on Justice League Action? So, okay. Oh, God, it's impossible. But I'm going to tell you one that was really interesting. And there were so many, so many amazing days and so many lucky people to meet. And, and I'm going to give you two, actually. I'm gonna give you two. So there was one day where I walked in and I was like, there's this incredibly tall, handsome man. Interesting. And I know that actor over there. And it was Michael Dorn and Armin Shimmerin. And they both were like, hey, we were supposed to have lunch today, but that I had a thing going on. And both of them, it turned out the thing they had going on that meant they had to cancel lunch was doing an episode with us. So Michael Dorn um, played Worf on Star Trek The Next Generation, and Armin Shimmerman played uh, the Ferengi, whose name suddenly I'm, is escaping me, but you all know his face. Um, and they, of course, had known each other for decades and were dear friends, right? These are insanely experienced actors, ridiculously skilled, decades and decades of experience, right? We walk in there, and Michael Dorn turns to me, and he goes, so you're the pro. Can you tell me what to do? And I was like, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and what it was, was this gift of somebody saying, what you are is enough. And the model of humility of somebody saying, I'm, I know how to act, but I haven't done this format before. And now he's done tons of animation because he's amazing. But that day was the day that he was like, I was like, oh, we'll turn your baseball cap around so that it doesn't cap, you know, bounce your sound under the microphone. Right. He didn't need help acting, but like, just like gentle reminders. And I was like, oh, today, even though I literally grew up watching you today, this is my house that you're visiting. Okay. It's okay to take some ownership of what, where you are and what you've brought to the table and imposter syndrome doesn't serve anyone. And I want to tell you a second story because this is also like a lesson I will feed on forever. There was a day that we were recording a session and Mark Hamill was there and I was and we were doing a group record and he happened to be on the microphone next to me, which was thrilling because of course I grew up, you know, with the taped off of TV, <laughs> Star Wars that me and my brother literally wore the tape out. Like, um, and I'm sitting there and it's his turn to record like a chunk of dialogue and I'm just watching him 
and he's sitting in his chair and he's in the microphone and he's he's like he's like working them and he's doing the stuff and i and my brain just checks out and i'm watching it and i'm like god if people knew how amazing he is and i'm just watching him be amazing and and i and i was like i i literally had the thought i was like if I could take out my phone and record this right now so people could see, but I would never violate anyone's privacy like that. I literally had that the whole thought in my head. I was like, I would never violate someone's privacy like that. But wow, I people should see this. It's incredible, like what he does and the unselfconsciousness of it, right? They call cut. He leans away from the mic and goes, oh, thank God nobody can see me. I look like a fool. And I was like, that's it, right? That's this person who's been iconic in so in like three generations of people's lives is can totally let go of self consciousness because he's behind the microphone and he can just do everything. And then he goes, Oh, thank God nobody can see me. Wow. And thankfully, people are putting him back on camera a ton because he's amazing and he's a joy and he deserves to be unselfconscious in everything he does because he's wonderful. But it was such a good lesson to go, oh, the thing that gets in our way for most of us, for most performers, most artists, most creators, is that self-consciousness that says, am I being weird? Am I doing too much? Is this going to be, are they going to like it? That self-consciousness ruins our work. This, the, the gift, the greatness comes when we just go, I'm just going to do it fully without checking in with someone else about what's okay. And that's the magic. And whenever an artist of any stripe can find, can tap into that, that flow, that freedom, that unselfconsciousness, that's, that's the gift. And getting to see it happen in front of me and see the check, I was like, Write this lesson onto your heart. You won't always be able to live it. I get self-conscious as much as anybody. But whenever I can remember, remember how powerful it is to let it go. Because it, it looks like genius. That's what freedom looks like. It looks like genius. That is amazing. And I think about overcoming that, it's amazing that even to understand the fact that if someone is getting like that, if someone's getting self-conscious, like say if someone, as you mentioned, like Mark Hamill, that's transcended so many different generations in terms of talent and like, you know, how much of an icon is, if even he feels that way sometimes, then it's so perfectly normal for anyone to to feel that, which is absolutely incredible. And I think speaking about like, you know, kind of surpassing different things, of course, your Wonder Woman also went into other stuff like we've mentioned Scooby-Doo. So do you recall how that crossover came about at all? That one, I was so lucky. I hadn't heard about the concept of uh, Scooby-Doo and Guess Who until they called me because I was really lucky to do the Wonder Woman in the the first season of it. Uh, and then I started to follow it after that. Um, but I was... I mean, I, I they had to, they called me and I immediately said yes, because I was like, I don't care what it is, but yes. And then I came back and I was like, um, wait, but am I, but what am I doing though? Am I doing like the, the Wonder Woman we did on that show? Or is it like some other thing? Or like, is it, how, how does this work? Because the show hadn't come out yet. And so I didn't really know. Um, and so I like prepared two or three different ideas of what it might look like. And then I got there and they're like, no, 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 we hired you to do what you do. So do you. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> that thing we've been talking about over yeah. and over, right? Like, they're like, we want what you bring. So let yourself bring that and we do that. And several things that we came up with on the day um, ended up in the show. Like, I don't know why, but I, we, I guess I do, because who doesn't love Scooby? I was like, I was like, Wonder Woman is a dog person. And they were like, yeah, I was like, yeah, Wonder Woman loves animals. Wonder Woman is a dog person. And so we crafted in the room this whole relationship between Wonder Woman and Scooby. And, oh, I just love you, Scooby. Love the Scooby. No, we need to go get the um the bad guy, right? And that made it into the show because we were having such a good time. And it felt so organic to the script that they had already written and what we were doing that that got to stay in. And we got to, I got to help craft some 
new bits for, for the show just based on the fun that we were having. Um, because it all came down to, well, this makes sense to me. Does it make sense to you? And they're like, yeah, look at how much sense it makes. Let's just do it. Um, and and you don't always get to, you know, write and craft something new, but that day we got to. It was super fun. It's so cool to hear. And I guess you've already answered this prior by mentioning that, you know, Justice League Action was the only one that you had a group recording for. And so for Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, was that mainly, say, liaising with or, um, showrunner Chris Bailey? Or did you ever meet Frank Welker, Matthew Lillard or any of that? You know, I should, I should take that back. We did actually, one of my two episodes, um, my, my Wonder Woman one, we did get to do as a group. Uh, by chance, the one where I came back, the the Tim Gunn episode, um, I think because Tim was in New York or something, I, I was in there on my own. Um, but that one I actually did, but it, <laughs> but it turned out um, both Gray and Frank weren't available that day for, for different reasons. And, um, and I think Matthew was working on a movie. Um, and so I get to, I got to have this really delightful time with Kate Micucci, who's just a doll. Um, and, uh, so it was she and I, and then the other, um, two guest stars who were, who were on that day, which was really great. Cause they were doing like the creature sounds and the, and like the ghosts and stuff. Um, and so we got to do all of that. Um, but it was, I was like, maybe, maybe Frank, I've never been in the same room with Frank someday, someday I'll be in the same room with Frank. Um, and he was supposed to be that day, but, uh, I think it was when there were like wildfires or something. And so he was like, I need to protect my house. I think is what it was. Um, whatever it was, he's definitely earned, uh, the right and the privilege to say, I'm not available today. I'll pick all up the, I'll pick those lines up on another day. <laughs> so that one I did get to work with Kate, um, and Mindy Cohn is a dear friend of mine. Um, so I didn't get to work with her on that Scooby-Doo but I now feel very lucky to have a Velma in my life forever. Um, Cause Velma was always my girl, to be honest with you. Like who doesn't love Daphne? I'm biased. I got to play Daphne. It was a great time and I loved it, but I'm a Velma girl. <laughs> in the science. <laughs> oh, that's great. And we've heard about a couple of shows, like, you know, there's been the fantastic opportunity for you to voice Wonder Woman. There's been the opportunity for you to be involved in Scooby-Doo, all of which you'd watched growing up, but then, I guess looking at the future a little, if your iteration of Wonder Woman to were to cross over with another franchise, is there any that you would in particular like to do? Oh gosh, to do another franchise? I, you know, I should have an answer for that, shouldn't I? I honestly, Let's put you on the spot, I'll admit, but so sorry. <laughs> the thing that's really fun about the the Wonder Woman that we that we did in Justice League action was like the sense of comedy of it, and so. And they're, see, this is the self-consciousness, right? They're going to be people who take issue with this. I have, I have young kids. And for me, what I would love to do the most is to, to, to do any crossover that made those characters accessible to little kids. So like, obviously it's hugely popular, but like Teen Titans Go or any of the, the like that age group would be like the biggest thrill for me because that would be something that I could immediately turn around and go, you don't have to wait. You can see this now. Like I'm I'm at this stage of my life and my career where I'm like, oh, I got to do spirit. My niece loves spirit. I can't wait to show spirit to my niece and to my my daughters. Like and my son too, but he's just too little. Um like I'm at the stage now where like the the greatest thrill for me isn't just doing stuff I love, but doing stuff that I can share with the people I love who right now are very small. So the stuff I would love the most is to do that. And at the same time, doing War World was so cool. Getting to do Constantine, that was like, almost like an R-rated character in an R-rated movie. <laughs> like, it was so cool because it dug into like the things that I love about reading adult comics. Um, but it's funny, like when you asked, I was like, oh, the first flash is like, what can we do for the like three to seven year old set that because I want them to be able to buy into the things I love the way that I did. 
Yeah, that's definitely understandable. And I don't know if it's just because we're getting exposed to these more doing interviews and stuff, but there just seem to be quite a lot of the, the you know, those nice preschool kids shows nowadays. Like you've got Bugs Bunny Builders and Bat Wheels. There's like a lot of those shows going on at the moment. So it'd be cool to have like your Wonder Woman maybe interacting with, with some of them over there. And given that Wonder Woman is such an iconic character, I mean... I think I saw it on YouTube. There's like someone that has like a whole room full of Wonder Woman merch and stuff. So I need to ask, in any capacity that you've met up with fans, be it a convention or anything else, like has there ever been a, a one or maybe a handful of like like of unique items that they've actually designed? Gosh, um, I'm so thrilled when somebody actually knows which one I've been a part of. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, look, I. There was a day where I went into a store and I was like, oh my gosh, there's an action figure of me. And I, I and like, it's not, it's not a Wonder Woman action figure. It's the action figure of my Wonder Woman. Like, so anytime somebody actually found one, cause they didn't make very many, it was kind of like a short run. Um, so anytime somebody's brought that, I feel so thrilled and honored that somebody actually went out and found it, that those are, those are a, a total delight. Um, but it's also like, it's been so fun to people bring like different versions of Funko Pops and um, different, you know, posters. There's this amazing, why am I blanking on that? There's a, a book, uh, it's a hardbound book and it's it's all um, Wonder Woman art from different creators. And I've had two different people bring me that book and ask me to sign a page. And I was like, well, I, I can't sign Gail Simone's page. You need to get Gail to sign that page. I can't sign Nicholas Scott's page. She needs to sign that page. Um, but getting to be, I mean, it's literally, it's it's being asked to be a part of that legacy, right? That book of, of documenting who has been a part of this legacy and this journey and getting to do that is really cool. So if anybody has that book, bring it. I would love to sign it. <laughs> that's amazing uh, it's so good to hear like you say the memories of like, the things that people have brought for you to sign and things like that and as we go to comic cons we're always kind of deliberating what we like to bring with us and oh, stuff yeah. like that so no it's great to hear your memories from that and i guess kind of again my last question was about the future this one is too do you have any upcoming projects that you are available to talk that you are able to talk about at this point the only thing that i can talk about right now is war world because it was just announced everything else i can't talk about at the moment <laughs> world it's really really fun um it's uh yeah it's a blast it's an adult um film uh it's it's not for the under 11 set uh but it's just the coolest idea of like what happens if the justice league was in other places and it's not quite mm -hmm. like a multiverse thing it's a little different um and that was a blast getting to do that was really really fun um are there any games my um trails of Trails of Cold Steel is the, I think it's Trails of, you know what? It's Trails of something. <laughs> there are so many versions of, of uh, Trails. Um, it was the new anime that I'm doing on uh, Crunchyroll uh, because I got to carry over the character that I was doing in the games, Claire Rebel, which has been really, really fun. So I'm getting to do my first legit anime dub, which is really fun. Oh, that's um, streaming there. Um, I don't think there's anything else I can talk about. It's so weird. I know that you guys must run into this all the time. People who are like, I can't tell you what's happening, but stay tuned. <laughs> and let me know when it's available. Yeah, especially like with voice. I was gonna say, especially with like the work that you do, like say voiceover, especially like you've then got to wait for all the animation art to happen and so many different processes after you've done with the movie and you're probably two projects on in your mind. And then like you say, you have to try and remember where projects are at and where they're up to. Yeah, something I didn't realize until I was working on it is it is not uncommon. I expected video games to have a longer turnaround. Video games oftentimes from the time that I voice it is between two and three years before it comes out. Um, my husband worked on one where it turned, we found out just recently, he was the very first voice they ever recorded on, on this one particular game. And so we didn't see that game for five years wow. till it came out. Cause like the first like proof of concept scene was his scene. Um, so sometimes it's just ages and in animation, it's very frequently a year before animation comes back and then there's ADR. And so it's often like 18 months to two years from the time that you record before it comes out. And because appropriately so, most of the time they want to keep the lid on everything. Sometimes it's, you know, two years or two years plus before marketing is like, yes, you can finally talk about this. 
Um, and all of that means that we get to walk around with really happy secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's, it's a blast. It's, it's really, really fun right now. I get to be excited because, um, some of my husband's shows have been announced and, uh, now I'm just waiting for people to hear about the joy of that. Um, so I'm just, I'm, and, and friends who are making it, um, Jake Castorania, who directed me on justice league action is also directing on X-Men 97, which my husband is in. And the, I can't even tell you the joy of seeing two of my favorite people working together. It's not my show. I'm not even in it, but getting to see them working together, getting to see them have the kind of fun that I got to have with the crew that I worked with and then getting to meet new crew members from that show, um, is it's such a thrill and, and all of it, all of it builds on itself and all of it continues to, to build together because, in the end, so much of this is about trust and relationships and sticking around long enough to see it all <laughs> come become the next thing. So that's really fun. That's a really long answer to a very short question. No, I mean, that really does seem to be so much to look forward to in the future. And of course, in regards to everything that you can't talk about today, is there anywhere that people watching can keep up with that work in the future when it is announced at all? Sure. Um, I... I'm still on Twitter for the time being at Rachel Kimsey. Um, I'm most frequently found on Instagram because I also post a lot of pictures of my chickens. <laughs> so come for the video games and the cartoons, stay for the chickens and the garden. Um, but whenever there's something I can talk about, that's, that's where it goes. And uh, in between, we try to just live in the joy of the things that make every day worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. I'll be sure to leave all of those links in the description down below. And that does conclude all of the questions that we have for you today. Just thank you so much again for all the time you've given us and for your amazing answers, which I'm sure will be very useful and insightful to people. Well, it has been such a blast. I really appreciate it. This is so much fun. Oh, thank you so much. And I guess for the purpose of wrapping up the video, thank you so much to everyone for watching. If you do want to see more, then please like, comment and subscribe and we'll see you next time.